Today we're talking about relationships. We're on session five, life goals, and we're talking about succeed in family relationships, in family relationships. How many of you here have a family? Can I see your hands? You better raise your hand, because if you don't raise your hand, you, you're probably an alien. I don't know how you got here, okay? Do you love your family? Yes. You love your family? Good. But can I tell you something? God loves and cares for your family more than you do. More than you do, believe it or not. How do you see your family today? How do you see your family today? If you were to fill up this photo with your family, how do you see your family? How do you want to see your family? The truth is we all come from different backgrounds. The reality is that all of us, we've got families where there's a lot of dysfunction. You know, parents are not loving each other. Maybe there's a lot of strife with the children. There's uh, broken families. There's second families. There's single-parent families. There are all kinds of families. As you sit here, I don't want you to feel left out. Don't feel left out because your family is the way it is. Understand that if you read the Bible, you'll see that there's no perfect family. No perfect family. You start off with even Adam and Eve who blamed each other for sharing that fruit, you know, that forbidden fruit. You have their sons, Cain and Abel. What did they do to each other? Cain killed Abel. Can you imagine? In this family, a very prominent family, the one of Abraham, they were promised a child with Sarah, but since they couldn't have a child, Sarah says, go ahead, you can uh, have Hagar, our, our maidservant, and, and have a child through her. He had Ishmael. Dysfunction. You go all the way to David, a man after God's own heart, and even David's family was filled with deceit, rape, murder, adultery, all of that put together. So friends, I want to encourage you. There is no such thing as a perfect family. But yet, but yet we must strive to do our best to improve our families. When it comes to my family, I love my family. And the truth is, I'll tell you, we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. We oftentimes struggle in a lot of areas. But we need to work hard. We need to work hard to, to maintain love, harmony, and peace in our family. We're just like you. We're just like you. We're on this journey. We're on this road learning to be the best we can. And friends, the key is this. Whatever situation you're in today, whatever circumstance your family is in, whatever family you are in, don't come to the point in your life where you say, Okay, Nato, I accept the way it is. I'll just live with this. No, don't do that because that is not true success. What is true success? What is true success? Becoming all that God wants you to be and doing all that God wants you to do and hearing Him say, Well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. That's what true success is. Friends, you and I must be all that we can be in our families. We must do all we can do in our families to be able to hear God say, well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. We all have families. God has put us in our families today. There was a question that was asked, a big survey made. What would make you happy? Simple question, right? What would make you happy? If you were to be asked that question, what would you say? They came up with a, a list of what people said, and they, they categorized it. When it came to tangible accomplishments, meaning career, wealth, bank account, financial status, 25% said that's what would make us happy. When it comes to emotional fulfillment, 14% said that's what will make us happy. When it came to good health, 8% said that's what will make us happy. But look at a good family life. How many percent? 32%. 32%, and you combine that with emotional fulfillment because when you have a good family life, you have emotional fulfillment. And so it really tops the list. Someone once said in that survey, most people would consider their life a success if they had a strong family unit, a solid and lasting marriage, or if they had done a good job of raising their children. Friends, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of job you have, how much you earn, how profitable your business is. If you don't have a happy home, none of that matters. None of it matters. 
when the home is filled with problems, your life outside the home will not have peace, will not have fulfillment. Is that right? Think about it. You have all these issues in the house with your wife and your children. There's chaos going on. There's disagreements. And then you have to go to work. As you drive to the office, you're thinking about what's going on in the house. As you're in the office working on your computer, working on your sales, whatever you're doing, you're thinking, the people in the house, those thoughts burden you. They, they weigh you down. They cause you to, to, to do inefficient work. You're not productive. You're not your full self. But if your family is doing really well, it changes you completely throughout your life. You and I, we don't own our families. We don't own our spouse, our parents, our siblings. We don't own any of them. They don't belong to us. But we have the responsibility to one day present them to our master. What would he say? Aside from our careers, finances, and our personal lives, God wants our families to be a success. What does that mean? That means there is hope. There is hope for your family, no matter what situation you're faced with today. Don't give up. Don't give in. And don't say, this is status quo. I'll just take it the way it is. I'll just, I'll just live with my family because this is the way they are. No, don't do that. I pray that every single one of you here who hears this message will rise above your situation despite your dysfunctions in your family and together with God, embrace family with love. Can you all say that? Embrace family with love. And that's the title of our message today. That's the title. God has given all of us, He's given us guidelines to restore, to rebuild, to replenish, to reinforce, to reestablish our families. God has given that to us. What's the answer? The answer, friends, might sound simple, but the answer is Love. Can you all say that? It's love. What does love mean? Listen carefully. Love means live with the differences. Live with differences. O means overcome offenses. Overcome offenses. V stands for value needs. And E stands for engage God's power. Love is the overall foundation that your family needs that you need in your heart to have a successful family. When you go to a doctor, the doctor will examine you, diagnose you, and come up with a prescription. The prescription is what you need to take as far as medication and medicines. And if you follow that prescription, your life will get better. Today, if you want your family to be healthy and strong, God gave us a prescription, a clear prescription on how to have strong, strong, loving families. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Let's all stand and and read this together. Deuteronomy 1, chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. The background here is that Moses has now come to the edge of the promised land. They're about to enter the land flowing with milk and honey. And before they cross over, God wants Moses to remind all the people about this important, this important reminder. So let's read that. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all these decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Thank you very much. Please have a seat. If you notice what Moses is trying to pass on, it's a message from God. And he says what's most important is families. Families are most important. He says if you want your family to be strong, 
you need to put God first and foremost. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with everything about you. And then teach your children. Teach your children the Word of God, all about God. Those are the two main requirements in order to have a strong family which expresses love and devotion for one another. Friends, look what it says. It says, repeat them again and again. Don't just teach your children once, but teach them over and over again. How do you teach them? You don't have a classroom. It says, talk about them when you're at home. Can you imagine? You spend time. You sit down, and you talk with your children about this. You talk to them about God and who God is in your life, what God has done for you. And it says, when you are on the road, in other words, you're walking hand in hand with your kids. You're walking as you're walking with them. You tell them about your struggles. You tell them about God's miracles in your life. You tell them how God has been so faithful to you. At night, it says, when you're going to bed, likewise, just before they sleep, you, you again recall the day and how God's been so faithful, and you express your gratitude to God. You pray with your children. You teach them about your dependence upon God. And then when you, when you get up, and when you're getting up, in other words, throughout the whole day, morning, evening, noon, the whole day, the whole day, it's all about God in their life. It's about sharing how God has touched your life. And so that's where it starts. Parents, can I just say, you are so important. Your lives impact your children so, so much. They need to see the life of Christ in you before they hear it. You are the walking Bible to them. It sounds simple, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. Even if your children are growing up today, even if your children are out of the house, even if you have a broken home, it's never too late to start. It's never too late. God has put you in your family today for a reason. You might be the only committed Christian in your family, but God has put you there to impact the rest of your family, your siblings and your parents. If we put God as top priority in our lives, we live our lives for Him, that will help us live lives for others. We will affect, you'll affect your spouse, your children, your parents if you're a child. It'll affect your siblings and even future generations. That's the way this works. God wants all of us to have strong, loving families. You can always find ways to improve your family. As you sit here today, looking at this and hearing this message, ask yourself, how can I improve in my family? What can we do? What steps can we take? So I encourage you, write down in your notes, in your cell phone, write down just a few things that, that speak to your heart that you need to take action with. That's what will make this message very effective. This all boils down to the foundation of love. Can you say love again? Love. Love is the key. What is love? What is love? The definition of love, you all remember? Love is an unconditional commitment, meaning it's not, it's not based on feelings. It's unconditional, meaning it's a decision. It's, it's a choice that you make. Towards who? Imperfect people. Are the people in your family imperfect? Yes. Are you imperfect? Yes. And therefore, we're, we're trying our best to commit our lives to love them, to love each other in spite of our imperfection. Seeking what? Seeking their highest good. Notice, not just sitting back and relaxing, but going forward, taking steps to, to do what's best for each other to seek their highest good, to, to help them achieve the, their full potential. And then often requiring sacrifice. And that might be the hardest because it'll take you time and energy resources to go out of your way to do things for others. And this involves sacrifice. It, it means giving of yourself. And this is where we have a hard time because we're very selfish, self-centered. We want things about ourselves. But this is going out of our comfort zone and it requires sacrifice. But it's all worth it because it results in the glory of God, God's glory. This is what we need, love. This is hard work, friends. As I said a while ago, it's, it's hard work. How many of you here want to have a wonderful family filled with God's love? Can I see your hands? I hope you all raise your hands because it's true. We all want that. There's a story about this Olympian swimmer, Olympic swimmer. He had a coach, and they were dedicating their whole summer to, to teach young kids who had potential how to be swimmers, Olympic swimmers. So they got them together. They chose 20 of them, and they asked these kids, do you all want to be Olympic swimmers like so-and-so? And they said, yes, yes, we all do, we all do. 
Okay, he got in the pool, and the coach started giving them skills and drills and all kinds of things. And the kids were in the pool doing all these things. After one hour, they looked around, and they saw only three kids left in the pool. The other 17 kids were in the kiddies' pool playing, splashing each other, laughing. And it's just like life. Many people say, I want, I want to do that. I want to be that. I want to, I want to achieve that. But they don't put in the hard work. They're not willing to go the extra mile. Maybe just those three kids left who might be potential Olympic medalists, swimmers. But what about us? We say, I want, I want that in my life, but are we willing to work? Friends, can I just say something? You're not alone. When you do this work of strengthening your family, God is with you all the way. Very first thing is live with differences. Can you all say that? Yes. Live with differences. God designed the family. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 24, it says there, The Lord God, read it with me, said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Look what it says. It is not good for man to be alone. Men, do you like to be alone? No. You don't like to be alone, right? Who likes to be alone, right? So God made a helper suitable for him. Because men, if you're, if you're alone, you'll cry like that baby. Really. And so God put a woman in his, in, in his life. She's a suitable helper. The, the perfect fit. And it says here, they're to leave their father and mother and become one. Husband and wife. This is the design of the very first family. You see, God intends you as a family to nurture your children, to Teach them to love God, to share, to serve God, and then to pass this on to generations. A man by the name of Zig Ziglar said this. He said, the best thing a parent can do for a child is to love his or her spouse. Would you agree? Yes. It's so nice when you see husband and wife, your parents loving each other. It's, it's a great comforting feeling, securing, securing feeling. But the Bible adds something to this. The Bible says, the best thing a parent can do for a child is to teach them about God and love his or her spouse. We're all created different, right? We have to live with our differences. Do you understand your differences? Are you different husband and wives, kids? Are you all different? We have so many differences. We have different quirks. and Do they irritate you? Do you get frustrated with each other? Do you just want to separate? Hold on, hold on. We are all different, you know, but we have to live with our differences. For example, husbands and wives. Wives, when it comes to choosing outfits to wear, you've got a closet full of clothes and you still say, what do I wear? I don't have anything to wear, right, women? But the men, it's the easiest thing. They just put on something in five minutes and they're out. But we like the women to take their time because we like them to look beautiful. When it comes to packing for travel, oh, women love to spend a whole month planning listing down all the things they have to do and making sure that the kids are well taken care of, the house is in order, and all these things that we need that, women, we need that so much. But men, when it comes to packing for travel, a few hours before going to the airport, they pack their bag and they're ready to go. That's crazy, huh? But that's what happens. When it comes to shopping, oh, shopping. There's a big difference there. There's a big difference. Women, it's an adventure. But for men, it's just a, a challenge to just go in and out and get what you want. Maybe for women who want to buy shampoo, you've got a whole list of criteria. This is the kind of shampoo I want to buy. It has to be recommended by friends. It has to have the right effect, the quality, etc., etc. But for men, as long as the bottle says shampoo, puede nayan. Okay, nayan, diba? A man's desktop in the office looks like this, right? But a woman's desktop looks like this. Women, you have to teach us, men. You have to teach us. We're all different. We're all different. Good, bad, no. It's, it's just that we're different. There was a, a woman who was driving on the road, and she comes across a man who was driving on the same road but going in the opposite direction. Well, they meet. They inter when they intersect, the woman rolls down her window and shouts, Horse! Wow. The man, immediately, the man, he rolls down his window and he shouts, Witch! Oh, boy. And they keep on going in their own direction. But the man who is laughing, laughing for what he told the woman takes the first curve and all of a sudden... <laughs> what happened? 
Friends, the lesson of the story, men never understand what women say. <laughs> never understand. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says this. You husbands, husbands should try to what? Understand the wife you live with. Try to understand them. That means you'll never understand them, but you need to try to learn to live with them. Okay? Learn to live with them just because they're different. And wives, just because your husbands are different, should not mean you resent them or you, you know, cancel them out. No, it means that you're just different. You can't really understand them, but try to live with them. Children. Psalm 127, verse 3 and 5 says this. Children are what? A, are a gift from God. They're a gift, meaning no return, no exchange. Okay? They are His reward. Children are like, a sh like sharp arrows. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. Would you agree, parents, that your children today are very different from each other? So different from one another. Their character traits, their likes and dislikes, everything about them is so unique and special. You cannot teach them all at the same, the same way, in the same level. They're all different. And that's what makes them unique. Just like arrows. Arrows are, are special. But sometimes arrows have bends in them. And we as parents have to straighten those bends. We have to teach them and keep on teaching them. If today you are burdened, if today you are desperate thinking, oh, my child is just not doing what I want them to do, what do you do? What do you do? You know what you do? You love them. And then you continue to love and pour out all your love to them. And pray for them. Just pray, pray, Lord, that God, would you just allow them to become all that you want them to be and allow them to do all that you want them to do and you just be there with them. Be available for them all the time. Friends, are the differences among parents and children and husband and wife, are they good or bad? They're neither. They're neither good nor bad. That's just the way they are. God made us all different. We should look at each other and celebrate our differences. Thank God we're not all the same. Think about how boring that would be. God just made us different. So how do you embrace each other's differences? How do you embrace each other? You talk to each other. You try to understand why do you do what you do, if that irritates you. Why do you do? Try to understand their feelings. Try to understand what their, their actions are behind it. Now, if what they're doing is not sinful, if what they're doing is not a personal attack against you, you need to just learn to live with it. Learn to live with it. If, however, you are doing something that does not show love and respect for the other members of your family, you need to look at your life and see how you can change, how you can, how you can adjust your lifestyle to honor them because you're part of the family. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Look out for what? For each other's interest, not just your own. Not just your own. Can you do that in your life today? Look out for other people's interests, not just your own. So embrace family with love by living with differences. Live with differences. O stands for overcome offenses. Can you all say that? Overcome offenses. Let me ask you, when you had something that was very precious, very valuable, that was very, uh, very unique, very delicate, and all of a sudden it broke, how did you feel? Especially if it was expensive, it was something of sentimental value. How did you feel? Were you sad? Were you, were you like crushed? Because that's, that, whatever that was, was so precious to you. There are some things that cannot be restored. But when it comes to relationships, God says there's always ways to restore them. There's always ways to, to re re reconcile. Let me ask you, how many of you here have had in the past a broken relationship. Can you raise your hands? How many of you have had in the past a broken relationship? I'm surprised that not all of you raised your hands. Because the truth is we've all, think about it, we've all had broken relationships. Every one of us has had a broken relationship. I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Don't go to sleep. Just close your eyes. Just a few minutes. I want you to think in your eyes, in your mind's eye. Is there ever a person or a name of a person that comes into your mind who has caused you pain and hurt? Has there been someone who's said an unkind word, a comment, 
a sharp criticism against you, a person who maybe shouted at you for no reason, or a person who did a careless act? Is there someone who intentionally attacked you or maybe a loved one from your family in the past? And because of that person or that individual in your family or outside your family, you today are living with resentment, with bitterness, with some sort of anger and rage and, and even a desire for revenge and confusion and doubt. And it could be against a family member or friend. Friends, relationships that are broken are not meant to stay that way. Remember that. Living with this pain will only ruin your life. It will prevent God from, from pouring out His blessings and power in your life to the fullest. My own life, I, I went on a downward spiral when someone did something against me, betrayed me when I never expected it to happen. And for months, I was just ruined. I just emotionally was so destroyed. And it came to the point where my relationships with other people were affected. My relationship with God was affected. And this can't continue, friends. When, when, you, when you forgive others, it's not for their sake. It's for your sake. It's for you to be set free. That other person might be living a guilt-free life. They are not even aware of what they did against you. And you're carrying this on. And today, maybe you feel like you've got a hook in your heart. And every time you think of that person, that memory, it just pulls your heart and it hurts. And you're thinking, what can I do to get back? And and friends, you cannot live this way. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. Don't be led by your feelings. It's a choice that you make. Turn your pain over to God and allow Him to make what was wrong right. Change your heart and you change your destiny with God. Remember that. Thank God that He gives us the glue that restores and reconciles relationship. You know what that glue is? That glue is called humility. Can you all say that? Humility. And the process, the method for gluing relationships is called forgiveness. Humility and forgiveness, hand in hand. There are two types of forgiveness. There's asking for forgiveness and giving forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 says this. Let's read it together. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander be what? Put away with you along with all malice. You see, friends, sometimes it starts off with just bitterness, a small pain, but that grows and grows when it's not dealt with. It gets so big, it becomes like, like anger, and then malice, you want to get back at that person. Verse 32 says, be kind to one another. Continue. Tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You know what this is saying? It's saying you and I have so much to forgive others for because we have been so forgiven. We have been so for The truth is, many people know this. They know this verse. They've heard this before, but they keep it here in their head. They haven't let it sink down to their hearts and taken action. You cannot live like this. Relationships are so important to God. As a matter of fact, he says, don't worship me if you haven't reconciled relationships. I prefer that you reconcile relationships than you, re than you worship me. That's how important it is to him. In Proverbs 19, verse 11, it says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to what? Overlook an offense. Relationships are like a bridge. A bridge is so delicate, it has to be built with intentionality. There's structure, there's stress and all this. Why? It's important because cars pass over this. Lives are at stake when they cross the bridge. They need to be built with intentionality. They carry a lot of weight. In a relationship... A relationship can be broken just because of neglect, because of conflict, because of misinformation, miscommunication. Is there a way to reconcile, to restore, to rebuild a broken relationship? The answer is yes, there is. The Bible tells us if you want to restore relationships, it's through humility. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says this, Clothe what? Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. You are not dressed for successful relationships if you have not put on humility. And let me tell you, humility is not something you put on and 
take off, put on, take off. No, you should keep it on all the time. Live with humility. Humility is not looking down upon yourself. Humility is, is looking at yourself as being infinitely valuable in God's eyes, but conscious of the fact that you're a deep sinner at the same time. The balance of those two things, infinitely valuable in God's eyes and yet the deep sinner as well. Humility is essentially thinking about God and others more than yourself. That's what it is. And the truth is, friends, so many relationships are broken and remain broken because people fail to grasp this truth about humility. They fail to grasp it. If today you have a ruined, damaged, excruciatingly painful heart due to a broken relationship, I want you to listen carefully. Listen carefully. Humility restores broken relationships. Can you all say that? Humility restores broken relationships. How? How? Friends, first and foremost, ask God's help. Ask God's help. Or go to godly people and ask for their help. But if you just tell people about your broken relationships, it leads sometimes to gossip. And it gets worse. It doesn't mend the relationship. It makes it worse. Go to God and ask God for help. How? You tell God, God, I want to confess to you my, my feelings. You see, because of what this person did in my life, because what happened in our relationship, I feel bitter. I feel angry. I feel a sense of, of hate towards that person. So you confess to God about your feelings towards this person. And the feelings that have led you to, to be, in a, in a way, passing the board of sin. Ask God for a humble heart. A humble heart and, and steps with wisdom on how to take steps to restore the relationship. James chapter 4 verse 6 says this. Everyone? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You've got two sides, pride and humility. Which side do you want to be on? I don't want to be against God. I don't want to be proud and against God because God opposes the, pride, the proud, but he gives grace to the humility, to those who are humble. Notice, he gives grace. What is grace? What is grace? Grace is the power to change. Grace is the power to heal relationships. Grace is the power to ask for forgiveness and to give forgiveness. Grace is the power to restore what you thought was dead. In your families today, oh, in families today, I hear of all kinds of offenses that have been committed to each other. And you need to restore these offenses. And grace, humility, forgiveness is what restores it. So what do you do? You go to God, you ask God for help. And then you take steps to go to that person in faith with love, in humility, with God's grace, with the right heart. And what do you say to them? You say to them, you know, my relationship with you is important. For whatever reason, I don't want to break our relationship. I want to remain friends, I remain family. I want to restore this relationship. And so you say, forgive me. Forgive me for whatever it is that you feel that you have done against that person. Specify it. Tell them this is what I've done and I'm sorry. Please, will you forgive me? And then you step back and you wait for their answer. That person will reply in two ways, one of two ways. The first way the person will say is, you know what? Don't worry. I, I never thought we had any problems with us. As a matter of fact, I never realized that we had any, a broken relationship. Everything's okay. You reply, you say, well, I'm so glad. I just want to make sure that everything with us is okay. I'm glad to hear that. The second response could be, you know what? Because of what you did, I will never forgive you. The pain that you caused me is too great that I can't forgive you now. They may even shout at you, curse you, whatever they do, but your response, your response must be, is there anything I can do to, to give you peace? You don't give excuses. You don't retaliate. You just say, is there anything I can do? You know, friends, you're doing your part. God knows you're doing your part. And you cannot control that person's heart. And so don't resent them for rejecting your apology. Just simply say, you know, if there's something I can do to bring peace, let me know. And if there's something you know that can bring peace, you do it. Go ahead and do it. Now, that's about asking for forgiveness. What about giving forgiveness, giving forgiveness? Many times when people come to us asking for forgiveness for what they've done against us, we say, no way. I'm not going to forgive you. You think it's that easy? I'm just going to say, you're forgiven and that's all? No, you're going to have to suffer the pain that I'm suffering now. We want justice. We want them to experience the pain that we have felt. Can you just imagine if God were to demand from us justice 
and say, you know, for all your sins, I'm going to bring upon justice, we would not be alive. For the wages of sin, the price of sin is what? Death. That's what we deserve. But God's free gift, his grace, his abundant grace is forgiveness. Shall we forgive those who ask for forgiveness from us? Shall we give that forgiveness? Friends, again, remember, if you have been forgiven by God, who are we not to forgive others? Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus I t- answered, I tell you the truth, not seven times, but 70 times seven. It's like 490 times. It's so many times, unlimited times. There's no end to your forgiveness for others, Jesus is saying. Parents, listen, if your children come to you with hurts, with pain in their hearts, and they want to share with you what you've done to them in the past, you don't even remember. You're not even aware of how you hurt them. But they're bringing this up to you. Listen, 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 listen. For them to do that is very, very courageous and difficult. So sit down, give them full attention, and keep quiet and just listen. Allow them to share what, whatever hurts are in their hearts. After you listen, you, you apologize sincerely. Say, I'm sorry for that that I caused you, and ask for their forgiveness. Do that because they need, you need to restore that relationship. Listen to them. Trust God that he will bring healing and restoration to your relationship. Now, what happens if the person who hurt you never comes to you and asks for forgiveness? They've done so much damage to your heart, but they never come to you and say, you know what, I want to say, I'm, I'm sorry. What do you do? What do you do? What does the Bible say? The Bible says you need to release that person to God. Release that. Otherwise, you will live with all that, that anguish. Colossians chapter 3.13 says this. Make what? Allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. I know that this is so difficult, maybe even impossible for some of you sitting here right now saying, there's no way you don't understand my situation. I don't, but God does. You see, humility recognizes that people are not perfect that we ourselves are not perfect. And there's a great price to forgiveness. Would you agree? There's a great price that you pay to forgive others. But can I tell you? There's a greater price if you choose not to forgive. Here's your project for this week. I want you to step out in faith, in love, with God's grace and humility, and seek out that person who you feel you have a broken relationship with. And take these steps. Ask God and go to them and express your your desire to restore that relationship. Do that. Now, if there's nobody in your mind that you can think of who you have a broken relationship with, just focus on your family, on your wife, your husband, your children. And one by one, at the proper time, in the proper place, just ask them the question, how have I hurt you? And then you listen. Listen to their heart. And after they shared with you, whatever it is that they want to share, you ask them, Will you please forgive me? And this is what bonds relationships once again. Forgiveness. And then you ask them, how can I improve? How can I improve? That's your assignment. Don't just listen to this, but take action. Write it down and take action. Because God wants all those offenses in your family to be set free, solved. How do we embrace love? We embrace love through humility and forgiveness. Live with differences, overcome offenses, value needs. Let's talk about value needs. Can you all say value needs? Value needs. The family is where you and I can really practice loving one another, loving as we love God. We can't hide anything from our family because we're with them 24-7. They see us all the time. Wives, wives, can I ask you, what is the greatest need of your husband? respect. You're right. Three women know the greatest need of their husbands. <laughs> I love you women. I know that you, you know, but you just don't want to say it. But that's true. Your husband needs... Now, he might not need it, but that, that's really what he needs. God designed him to want respect, to need respect. And so therefore, God gives a command to, to wives. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse... You know it, ladies? 5, verse 22. It says there, wives, be what? Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is very familiar to you, ladies. You hear this verse over and over again, recited by your husbands. 
Husbands, stop saying this verse to your wives. Please, this is it says wives, not husbands, okay? Let your wives hear from God, not from you, even if this is the only verse that you know in the Bible, okay? Tamana. What does this mean in a very practical sense? Ladies, it means you support your husband as he leads. You support him. You encourage him as he fulfills the great responsibility that God has given him. You're not a team. You're not a team. You're one. You are one. You are vital to his success and the success of your family. Don't try to operate separately. It's not a win-win situation here. It's just one winner and one loser. And if you lose, you both lose. Now, that's easier said than done. I know, I know. Because your husband is not always making godly decisions. Your husband sometimes is failing in his leadership responsibilities. His decisions are not aligned with your desires. What do you do? What do you do in a case like this? Let me ask you. Will God always be in sovereign control of your life? Yes or no? Yes. Will God ever forsake you or leave you, ladies? No. Does God want what's best for you? Yes. Especially when you're walking in commitment with Him. Because you have God on your side. Because you have God on your side. You can be confident that as you submit, God will protect you and care for you. Now, is this submission unconditional? Is this an unconditional submitment for wives to submit to their husbands? The answer is no, it's not. It's as to the Lord. Can you all say that? As to the Lord. Meaning, when your husband asks you to do something that's outside God's guidance, meaning it's sinful, it's hurtful, it's spiritually destructive, it's not God honoring, then wives, you can appeal, you can express to your husband, I will not cross that line. Ladies, listen, your husband will never be all that he can be apart from you. Your encouragement, your prayers, your love, your comfort, you are precious and vital to your family. His victories are going to be your victories. His prosperity will be your family's prosperity. There is nothing more beautiful than a woman who understands her role, her God-ordained role, and fulfills it by helping, encouraging, and inspiring her husband. Men, what is the greatest need of your wives? Love. Yes, it's love. See, five men said love. You're right. Husbands, your wives need to be assured of your secure love. Right, ladies? Yes, now you can say yes. And that's why God gave husbands this verse. Husbands, love your wives just as what? Christ loved the church. What a comparison. Men, you need to understand that this love that it's talking about here is not a romantic love. It's not a feeling love. It's not a, uh, you know, up in the sky love. It's, it's, it's a decision. It's a commitment. I will love my wife whether or not she, whatever, okay? It's a decision. How did Christ love the church? He loved the church sacrificially. And that's the way we love our wives, sacrificially. Christ gave his life for the church. How should we give our lives to our wives? We should be ready to die for them, ready to live for them and give them whatever it is to please them. Your focus, husbands, should be sacrificial. You're the sacrificial leader, lover, servant of your wife and your family. Husbands, I have to tell you, listen, I have to tell you, don't you dare abuse your position. Are you hearing me? Just because God has given you this position doesn't mean that you can take advantage of it because your wife loves God so much that she's willing to follow you. Don't take advantage of her that way. Don't lord it over her. Don't make unreasonable demands upon her because you know that she will submit to you because she loves God. Don't act like you're superior to her in any way. Men, you need to be able to present your wives to God as a blessing. You're to care for her, nurture her, love her as you love yourself. Now, men, if you sacrificially love your wives and treat them so precious, I bet you a wife would love to submit to you. Is that right, ladies? Yes. yes. You try it. You try living a life of sacrificial love and care and servanthood to your wife, and she will love you and submit to you in many ways. Now, further in the passage, it talks about children. Children, it says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. If you're living with your family, if you're living with your parents, you are there as, a, as an influence upon your family. They might not be Christians, but since you are, your life, your life speaks the love of Christ. It should reflect what Christ's love is. As a general rule, your parents want what's best for you, whether or not they're 
Christ followers. They want what's best for you. They don't want to give you a miserable life. Believe me. Right, parents? You want to give your children the best? Yes. yes. Be assured of that. Sometimes it might seem unreasonable, but believe me, they want what's best for you. You ought to follow them because it's for your protection. But again, follow them. Why? Because you're doing this in the Lord. It's because of your love for God that you do this. You should pray for your parents. Honor your parents. Talk to your parents. Reason out with them if you need to. But it's very important for you, for all of us to understand, what's the context of all of this? Valuing the needs of others. What's the context? Because we, we saw husbands love your wives. We saw wives submit to your husbands. Children, honor your parents. Fathers, don't exasperate you. We saw all this. How is this possible? What's the context here? There's a verse in Ephesians 5.21 which says, And be what? Subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Notice, this is for everyone in the family. Everyone is to be subject to one another. You know what that means? It means mutual submission. Can you all say that? Mutual. mutual submission. You know what mutual submission means? Listen, it means I am here for you. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. I'm here to do whatever I can for you. That's what mutual submission is. How do we mutually submit to one another? Ephesians 5.18 says, Be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That's where we get the power. That's where we get the ability to mutually submit to one another. We can't bring that up on our own. It comes from, from the Spirit of God Himself. Mutual submission. That's what we need. When families living out the love of God through mutual submission to one another, they are fulfilling God's desire for their family. The message of mutual submission, again, is I'm here for you. Whatever you need me to do, I'm here for you. Regardless of where you are in the hierarchy of your family structure, whether you're the father, the mother, the child, the sibling, whatever, you need to be able to apply this in your life, mutually submit to one another. The thing that blows this tremendously into perspective is this, this one question, and this is the question, what can I do to help? Can you all say that? What can I do to help? This is the game changer. Believe it or not, if you come out and say to each other in the family, what can I do to help? That's where you value each other's needs. That's where you are helping each other in mutual submission. Wives can submit to their husbands because they're spirit-filled. Husbands can, submit to, can love their wives because they're spirit-filled. Children can do likewise. You're all mutually submitting to one another. Let's all say that again. What can I do to help? Now, this is an offer of your person to others in the family. Can you imagine if you were say, to say this to each other every day? What can I do to help? Now, I'll tell you something, huh? Children, be ready. When you say this to your parents, be ready to pick them up off the floor because they're going to be so shocked when they hear that from you, okay? They're going to be so shocked. They, don't know any, they won't know what to say, all right? But you try it. When you come home from school, when you come home from, from the office, wherever, from, from sports, you tell your parents, Dad, Mom, what can I do to help? And they, they might tell you something. They might even have nothing to tell you. But you try this. When they have guests in the house, when they have guests come over and they're all sitting in the, in the living room and you walk in, you say, excuse me, excuse me, uh, Dad, Mom, what can I do to help? And listen, if they say something, do it. If they're not, then you leave. You know, their friends, their friends are going to say, wow, what was that? Can you teach us? Can you teach us? We don't know how to parent. How do you get your kids to say that? Now, just because I said it to you today doesn't mean you wait three months to do this, okay? Even if you do it this afternoon, your parents will be truly emotionally impacted by, by that statement. Try it out. Emotionally impacted. Now, I know that some of you are scared, thinking, if I say that, what if they ask me to do something that I really can't do, or it's beyond my, my me time, or my agenda, my personal time? What, what if I have to go out of my way and do it? Listen, it could possibly be that one day Jesus looked down at the earth and saw what a mess and sinful life we had. And he goes to his father and says to his dad, Dad, what can I do to help? And the dad says, oh, you don't want to know, son. You don't want to know. No, no, dad, tell me. What can I do to help? Tell me. And the dad says, well, you know, if you want to really help, you'd have to go back to earth and, and, and you'd have to go to earth and, and become a man. Not just a man, but a slave. And Jesus probably says, well, I could do that, yeah. Oh, not only that, but... You know, son, maybe one day you'd have to give your life as a sacrifice 
in anguish and pain and die on the cross for the sins of mankind. And Jesus could have probably said, Dad, not my will, but, but your will be done. Friends, when you're asked to do something beyond your comfort and you do it, just realize you are now following the steps of Christ. Husbands, before you leave the home, turn to your wife and say to your wife, Honey, what can I do to help? Because many times your wives are waiting for you to ask that question and they're scared to ask it because they might hear resentment like, I've got so many things to do. The officer asked me to do something. No, no, no. no. Ask them, what can I do to help? That opens up their hearts to, to know and understand that you love and care for them. Just try it out. Just try that out. And you'll see great wonders happen in your life. What's the question again? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? If you want to embrace your family with love, value each other's needs. Even siblings in families, oftentimes you don't talk to each other. Oftentimes you just live side by side, but offer help to each other. How can I help you? How can I? And you know, it changes the dynamics in the whole family. It brings the family together in many, many ways just by this simple statement, what can I do to help? Live with differences overcome offenses, value needs, and the last one is engage God's power. I know you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, this sounds great. This sounds really good. I can't wait, but you know what? I can't do it. I can't. There's just, I don't, I can't do it. It's just too hard. There's a story of this little boy who was trying to pick up this heavy rock and trying to lift it up and lift it up with all his might. And his dad was beside him looking at him and says, son, are you using all your strength, all your might? And the little boy said, yes, dad. And he was crying already. I'm giving it all my strength and all my might. I can't. And the dad said, son, you're not using all your strength. You haven't asked me. Like many of us, we try to do things on our own strength. But we're not using all our strength because our strength comes from God. That's where the power comes from. Jesus, before he left us here, he wanted us to be able to fulfill all of his decrees, commands, all the principles that he gave us in the Bible. He wanted us to fulfill it, not just say, go ahead and try on your own. No, he gave us a promise. The promise is in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look what it says there. Everyone, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, that's Manila, throughout the Judea, the Philippines, in Samaria, that's Asia, and to the ends of the earth. What was Jesus saying? He says, you, all of you, can receive power, this dynamite power, this amazing abundant power, when you receive the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he left his Holy Spirit for us to be able to have his power on earth, divine power. It's impossible for you and I to ever fulfill any of this. Impossible. But with His power, nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible. We cannot make it on our own. This is not human power. This is Holy Spirit power. This is divine power. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says this. How what? How tremendous is the power available to us. Us who believe in God. What kind of power is it? This is the same power demonstrated when Christ was raised from the dead. We don't understand the power that we have, the power to forgive, the power to be humble, the power to, to just do things for other people more than ourselves. This is a power that God gives us. But it all comes from love. Love is the source. And if your source of your love is yourself, it's going to dwindle. It's going to run out. You're going to lo- run out of love. But if you go to the true and only source of love, the love that you share with others will be everlasting. It'll be overflowing. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, everyone, beloved, let us love one another. For what? For love is from God. Notice it's from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Friends, your source of love is God himself. And it's an overflowing, abundant source. Someday, we will all stand before God. And He will ask us, what did you do with your family? 
He won't ask you, how much did you provide for your children and family from your career, from your business? How much did you give them? No. He won't ask, how many hours did you work in your, in your job to be able to provide for your family? No. He's going to ask you, how did you love me and share that love with your family? That's what he's going to ask. What will our reply be? What will we reply? Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, God, who is what? At work, continue, within you, within you will what? Will give you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. As I said, this takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. Are you willing to do the work? But you're not alone because God is with you. God is with you all the way. Are you willing to work with God? Are you willing to work with God? Are you willing to embrace family with love? Live with differences, overcome offenses, value needs, and engage God's power. Did you learn something today? Yes. I'm so glad. But you know, friends, what will bless the Lord even more is taking what you learned today and applying it in your life. In each and every family that is here, if you just take one step of faith with love, God's grace and his humility to apply this in your life, you will see changes happen. You will see changes happen in your life. I'm excited for you. I'm excited. As I prepared this message, again, I was so inspired. I don't know why, but I was inspired again. So I put together a little poem. Do you want to hear it? We, We can go already. We can go. Okay. It's entitled, My Family. We come into this world through a family we didn't choose. Our parents and siblings were strangers we could not refuse. Isn't that right? We lived in a country that had a culture and religion of its own, a language, food, dress, flag, and a different time zone. It's not easy getting along with family members who are so distinct and diverse. They each have their strange ways. I wondered if they were from this universe. Growing up always being told what to think and do and how to tie my shoe, I often thought, when would I ever be able to make my decisions on what to do? One day, my dad, mom, and siblings all together made a commitment. Since I was then living on my own, I had no idea. I was just indifferent. They told me about God, Jesus, and the Bible, who they wholeheartedly love. I was intrigued because this changed their lives like they were from above. I watched from a distance how this transformed the family I thought I knew. I saw how God changed their hearts and lives, making them all brand new. When I finally discovered the truth about my sin and Jesus' death, I couldn't resist his love for me as he sacrificed his life till his last breath. My family are no longer strangers who live for themselves alone. We now have hearts of love and care because Jesus is our cornerstone. I'm so blessed having my own family that God has given me today, seeing how each of them has chosen to follow his only way. My prayer is that all families will be shining beacon of Jesus' love, knowing that this is what will draw many others to surrender to him above. <laughs> Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let's join our hearts and pray. Lord God, we thank you for loving us and our families. We thank you for never giving up on us. We thank you that you've given us everything we need to, to have strong, loving families. May each and every one of us here today Truly embrace your love and pass it on to others in our family. We know, Lord God, that our families are so important. They're the only ones we have. And I pray for all the hurts, all the pain, all the brokenness in the families today, that you would be the one together with these individuals to restore these families. We know, Father, that families will be shining light to lead others to come to know you. I pray for every single individual here, Father, in the challenge and the struggle that they're facing right now after hearing this message, that you would just embrace them with your love and give them 
the courage, the peace, and the confidence that you are with them, that nothing can stop your family from becoming what it could be. Friend, trust in God and allow Him to take you on that journey. See what He will do. Experience the miracles that He will put in your life as you take one step at a time. Lord, we thank You that You love us and continue to love us in spite of our failures. We give You our hearts. We give You our lives. We love You, Father. We pray all of this in the precious, magnificent, and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be all the glory. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. God bless you all. I love you guys.